Hi, Phil Maddox and moguls. Welcome to the show today. Today, we have a very special guest. We have Luden Lee. Luden Lee is the executive chairman and CEO, president, global studio operations of Rice Rocket Entertainment Holding Company, Luden INC. Luden, welcome to the show today. Thank you. Thank you. How are you doing? Great. And the um, reason we have Luden on is um, he's fantastic in entertainment and, and investments, but we want to celebrate Asian and Pacific Islander Heritage Month. So we want to just wish everyone a great month. And Luden, thank you for being on the show today. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for having me. It's my first podcast. You know, I've been, I've been hiding for the last 10 years. <laughs> Wait, this is your first podcast? Oh my god, I'm so excited! Filmatics and moguls, did you hear that? I mean, what? Uh, and that's that's a point of reference too. That when people are busy and working and building, you know, like their companies and um, their executives and chairmen and creators, they're busy. They're busy working. So if they're not on social media, it's probably because they're building their empires. But um, Luden, can you let everyone know where you're recording with us today from? Uh, I'm in San Francisco. I live in North Beach. I'm a, a block away from Washington Park. So uh, every morning I get my coffee down at Bishop Wharf at 7-Eleven and uh, I walk back. It's an hour. I listen to my Spotify and I hang out with my military veterans. You know, there's a apartment that house like disability uh, veterans. You know, they're like their seniors and we smoke weed. You know, they hang out, you know, and I, and I go to work at night, you know, get my day going. That's amazing. Oh. And uh, when we were talking too, you love like all the little coffee shops, but um, I love it how you, you still go to 7-Eleven and get a coffee. But uh, do you have a favorite coffee shop in San Francisco that is opening back up that you've missed? Yeah, this one block, Cafe Greco, it's like uh, they're, they're owned by Latinos. It's always there. And, you know, North Beach is an Italian district in San Francisco. There's outdoor seating, so it's like you can get coffee for four dollars, and it's like refills two dollars. They have free Wi-Fi, so like you know, like I don't, I don't, I don't pay for like Comcast or like any other internet Wi-Fi in my uh, apartment, and uh, because I just just walk down the street and just get my coffee and then work all day there. Eat. You know, I could hang out all day long and do my video conference meetings and my phone calls and my emails and like you know, if I want, I'm hungry, I just order food from them. You know. So I, I live, I'm very fortunate to live in a district because I, North Beach is like one block over from Chinatown, right? And, and, you know, Chinatown, you know, like they open six o'clock in the morning so you get dim sum and all that, you know, or like, you know, you get like porridge for $4, you know, it's like, first of all, I hop, you spend $20 for breakfast, you know, whatever, right? So, so, you know, I live in San Francisco. I was born and raised here. You know, uh, I'm Chinese American. I, I was born in Chinatown. Uh, my family, uh, we met in uh, Chinatown. Uh, my dad was an uh, immigrant and came in the late 60s. You know, so I was a waiter, didn't have any money. Um, he was speaking English and he learned, you know, from the communities in, the, in Chinatown. My mom, she immigrated from Hong Kong um, during the immigration movement in the, in the late 60s and 70s when congress decided to pass a, a law a uh, bill to you know have asian countries come over to the u.s so that was a whole asian wave that came over and uh, chinatown san francisco is the biggest chinatown in the u.s you know, it was like several blocks you know and, and uh, the chinese community is big in 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 san francisco you know and we had a mayor you know ed lee he, he passed away during his mayorship, but other than that, you know, like uh, Asian Americans, you know, think about entertainment. You know, I mean, like Hollywood, you know, they they they're, they're not seeing the big picture here. You know, take for example, Crazy Rich Asian. You know, it was like a new thing for the U.S. for the for the, the non Asian market, right? And it was like people are blown away by it, right? It made a lot of money at the box office, but it pulled in China, right? Because we're, we're, we're Asians, we're accustomed to see this kind of stuff. You know what I mean? So. You know, from Silicon Valley, you know, aha, there, there's a market opportunity here to actually utilize Asian American creative talents and also filmmakers and producers. There's not a whole lot of us, you know, because, you know, we we're, we're taught that way growing up when we we're at school. You know, we we're, were, you know, go to college, get straight A's, you know, get scholarships and, 
you know, get a job as a doctor or a lawyer or an accountant or engineer. You know, there's no guys like me, you know, running around Hollywood and video game industry and the music industry and the comic industry, going to Comic Con, going to E3 and Game Developers Conference and uh, South by Southwest. It's like, you know, like for me, it's like, you know, I, I'm very fortunate with how I started in the industry, you know, because, you know, there needs to be more Asian Americans like me in this industry because like, I can't do it all alone in terms of what I do. Uh, which is uh, building new tech Hollywood in Silicon Valley. That's amazing because um, I want everyone to know that uh, uh, Luden's company is Silicon Valley Rice Rocket, and we're celebrating, or you're celebrating, uh, I'm celebrating with you, and everyone that is celebrating Asian Heritage Month for developing new tech in Hollywood. So can you explain that a little bit, um, what that means when you say new tech in Hollywood? Because I know you're a big gamer, and, um, you know, you started your, I, I want everyone to know, can you tell us how you started your career? And first I want to tell them that you're the year of the tiger. So can you share what that means? It means like, I'm very good at business and politics. You know, I'm very diligent. I can be very stubborn. You know, I'm learning not to you be that much stubborn, you know, to give people the benefit of the doubt that, you know, they could be right or wrong or I could be right or wrong. You know, it's like, it's always like, I'm always the alpha, you know, the male, you know, and uh, I'm definitely not passive aggressive, you know what I mean? Like, you know, and, uh, you know, so, so, um, yeah, I mean, I'm just having a good time. So how I started, you know, it was like, you know, before I, I joined the corporate world and I was in college, I, I volunteered a lot in the uh, Asian American community. You know, I, uh, I volunteered at the Asian Law Caucus where I did uh, translations with uh, Cantonese-speaking uh, clients um, to talk to attorneys, you know, because the Asian American attorneys who work at ALC, you know, they were like Mandarin speaking, right? So it was a uh, language barrier between Mandarin and Cantonese speakers, right? So I did all that, right? And I did a lot of civil rights advocacy work in the 90s, you know, and I, I thought I wanted to get into immigration law and, and get into politics, right? That was, that was like my dream, you know, but, you know, that, that changed when I needed money. You know what I mean? Like I was looking for a job, you know, and, uh, you know, there was a job posting in the Chronicle for a, a game tester, electronic arts. So I applied, right. And I got interviewed and they asked me a bunch of questions about golf, you know, like, do I play PGA 46 or do I play this and do I actually play in real life? And I was like, yeah, I actually do. You know, in fact, when I was in college, you know, we played the PGA game for the Genesis. We played for money. We played for skins. So, <laughs> so I was familiar with the, you know, so I was familiar with the EA Sports brand, right? So, so I got the job making eleven dollars an hour, and the first game I tested was Tiger Woods '99 for the Windows PC, right? And this was back in 1997, more than 20 years ago, you know, making eleven dollars an hour, and I experienced crunch mode, you know, that's what we call it in the game industry because you know we, we well, you know, we don't get paid by the hour, you know, we do by law, we get paid by the hour, but like. There's deliverables with milestones. You know, if we if we miss our ship date, you know, there goes the stock price, right? You know, you know, we fucked up, right? So, so you know, you know, I was I was taught early on at a young age, you know, being an entrepreneur today, is that you got to put in a long hours. You got to do more than forty hours a week. You know, you got to be like a professional player, like Mark Cuban said in business. You know, so I, I started EA, you know, doing Tiger Woods '99. You know, it was an opportunity where the company was growing. You know, so like I moved up pretty quick in the world in the EA uh, company. And, uh, you know, and there was a point where I couldn't move up any further, right? I worked there for six years, right? I wanted to do more than uh, just, you know, do what I was doing. And there was a job opening for a QA manager uh, for a mobile game company, right? And back then, this was back in 2003 when there was still snake on cell phones, right? And today it's like the mobile game business half the revenue the industry. So, so, you know, I was like, okay, if I'm leaving from a big publicly traded company like EA, join a startup, right? I'm like, and why not? Right. Because I can learn a lot, you know, about, you know, working in Silicon Valley. Okay. So I joined and, and the guy that, that founded the company uh, was the guy who he, he designed the original John Madden football. Right. You know, he also worked for EA as well. He was an executive. He also designed uh, NHL hockey and FIFA and NASCAR and other titles for EA sports. 
So he had uh, raised money from Silicon Valley to start a, a, a game publisher for mobile games, right? Well, can, um, that, that can we let everybody know? Um, sorry, Liv, uh, Scott Orr that you're talking about, right? Is that Scott Orr? Yeah. Industry yeah, he pioneer. Was, he, was okay. much, he was pretty much my mentor. You know what I mean? Like, like I worked with, I got fired with him, you know, when Greg Dollar took over Glue Mobile. And that was Glue Mobile. He founded Glue Mobile, right? And went publicly traded on NASDAQ in 2007. I think the market cap was like $350 million. So, so it went public and recently got bought by EA, I think for like three or four billion, right? So, so you know, Scott Orr was a pioneer in the industry before he actually got a job at EA. He worked for Activision, right? And before that, he had GameStar, right? In the 80s, right? And basically, he had a, basically a development and publishing business for games, you know, for back in the 80s, you know, before the game industry is today, you know, because back then, Everybody thought it was a toy business, you know, the kids play it, right? But think about the kids today, they're all adults, right? Think about what's going on in, in the gaming industry. It's bigger than Hollywood, you know, it's, it's pretty much, you know, it's $150 billion. That's what they estimate, right? Half of it's mobile, right? So it's growing and it's evolution of the video game industry, how it converges with film and animation, right? Because think about what Hollywood is, right? I mean, we look at the logistics of the, uh, the studios, right? Before they all got acquired by bigger companies, right? Like, were they actually making money? You know, because if they were making money, they wouldn't get bought, right? Like Fox got bought by Disney, right? Paramount, uh, Viacom merged with CBS, right? And you have like DreamWorks Animation being acquired by Universal Comcast, right? And you have like Time Warner going to AT and T. I mean, like they were liquidating the assets for VOD, like Netflix. You know, that was the whole purpose of the acquisitions and mergers, right? Look at what's going on today, right? Everybody's competing, trying to be like the next Netflix, right? So, so when you look at the, the how they make money, it's licensing. It's all about like when you look at movies, right? It, it's a billboard for for merchandise, right? Spider Man did it actually make money for Sony? I don't know, right? But I know they made money on the video game for licensing, you know, because of the uh, spider-man game right so so you know from a career perspective right there's opportunity to say wait a minute here right especially for independent film guys right or girls right it's like instead of you raising money right just only for your film why not raise your money for your video game or your t-shirts or your trading card right or your collectible action figures right make it into a transmedia equity financing venture right because you're doing something that's very disruptive right one like you you're sharing the assets that you own and create with directly with the shareholders, right? Your investors. Okay, and I'll get to how you can get that later, right? So, so what what digital uh, uh, media is going? It's all about five G internet. You know, think about this, right? It's like if you want your movie at AMC or Regal, right? The theater chains, right? You know, they 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 really make roughly like eleven to twelve billion dollars a year, right? It's not really the compound growth rate. It's not really that high. You know, it's all based on the economy, right? And it's all based on 3D sales too, right? So, so, and, and uh, you know, they take like 50 to 60% of the ticket sales, right? So you're making half, pretty much half of what the ticket makes, right? And, you know, the theater chains, they don't, they don't spend money on marketing to, to, to promote your movie. You know what I mean? They, you have to do that yourself, right? So, you know, on top of the money you spend on production, you also got to spend money on marketing. Right, the, the PA fund, right? That's what they call it, right? I don't know what they call it now, but when I did, they call it PA fund, right? So, so, so you take all that considerations, like, what the fuck, right? It's like, is it really worth the investment to put moving theaters? Not really, right? Well, what's, what's the catch here, right? So, well, YouTube, you know, what Google reported was a $15 billion business, right? It's growing, right? I, I read an article recently. That you know they made like six to eight billion last quarter on ad revenue. You know what I mean? So you know the YouTube platform is much bigger than Exhibitors platform, right? So instead of putting movies in lucky theaters, why not put it on YouTube and generate ad and sponsorships, right? You include behind the scene footage and actors and interviews and things like that. You make a complete channel, right? And what you're doing is you're promoting your sales, you know, for director's cut version of it, right? Because there's people out there who love your movie. But don't want to sit down and, and see the ad you know, every 12 minutes, right? You actually see a director's cut version, you know, where they can rent or buy. You know what I mean? So it's like, for example, you can have the director's cut version of Amazon Prime and Apple and Roku and YouTube movies and any other VOD platforms that charge as a rental or a purchase by streaming, right? You can do that way. You don't need a distributor from Hollywood to, to manage that for you. You just go on LinkedIn and find the right people that manages the uh, business for the right 
you know, accounts, or you go to Amazon, just do a Google search for Amazon VOD and sign up a membership, right? So you don't need to give a percentage to a distributor or find a sales agent, you know? And it, it's all bullshit because it's like, at the end of the day, what I've learned about working in Hollywood, right? It's like, there's a waterfall effect, right? I, I go out and raise money, right? And whatever it is, movie it is, I, I, I raise, right? Which I was never successful doing because the investors I know are pretty savvy and pretty smart. You know, they're not dumb. Okay, um, so so you know you, you you pay the exhibitor, they take fifty to six percent of the of the cut of ticket prices, right? And you have the adjusted gross, right? Then you have the you know the distributor, you know, with Lionsgate or some other independent distributor that distributes your movie for you, right? They take a cut, right? For you to very likely get that movie picked up, you, you put it in the film festival, right? So you had a sales agent, right? So that person takes a cut, right? And, and so forth and so forth, right? At the end of the day, what does an investor get? Pretty much nothing. It doesn't work that way in the real world. You know what I mean? I don't know how that all created. We look at the independent film financing model. When was the last time it was updated? You know, especially with the 5G internet. You know what I mean? So, so you know, when, when people go out and raise money for film financing, right, you got to look at the possibilities. One, do you have a business plan rather than just a pitch, right? How are you going to make money for the investor? You know, how are they going to get the money back in return? You know, like, What's your go-to strategy in terms of getting your film right distributed on a global scale? Like, who do you actually know besides Hollywood? You know what I mean? So, so um, that's basically new tech Hollywood because we're not doing like traditional Hollywood's doing. We're not spending like a hundred million dollars for a film. That's just ridiculous for us, right? Because you and I are pretty savvy. We're like, we can take the same amount of money and invest in a hundred startups for a video game. Bigger return on our investment. You know what I mean? So, so basically, that's new tech Hollywood. I don't want to get into it, or, you know, given a little limited time we have. But you know, you can always email me, you know, by going through my LinkedIn, you know, and checking me out, adding me, and I can, you know, give free advice for any content creators out there, and you know, educate about new tech Hollywood. Yeah, so Luden, I just want to let everyone know. So, um, so really quickly, so you you were um, started as a video game tester for Electronic Arts, which is EA and you tested the first sports for Tiger Woods Pro Golf Tour. I mean, and then so you studied under industry pioneer giant Scott Orr, who was the original designer of John Madden football. That's amazing, and founder of Glue Mobile that you sit and DC to D to C games. Um, and also publisher of video games, digital comments, movies, and TV shows for like Sony, PlayStation, Microsoft, Xbox, and Nintendo. And he just sold it, right? for for like like big huge amount so you are now like um your company is like now doing the digital media and and it's also entertainment entertainment holding company so that's what you're going to be launching are you in the process of launching right now and raising the capital for this company you already you already raised it right well, I can't talk about it because I haven't finalized anything yet. I mean, um, but the thing about fundraising is like once you get first money in, everybody comes in, right? Okay. And it's all about the commitments, you know, like, you know, are they really going to pull through and writing a check, right? So that's where I'm at right now. You know, but at the same time, it's like I'm not a broke joke, you know, like I actually made money, you know, um, and I know how to, you know, spend my money wisely in terms of bootstrapping. You know, because one thing you learn about building a startup in Silicon Valley is like you're very limited on resources. You know, it's like the first thing you do is you build a tech demo, right? It's like how do you get the money to build a tech demo? Well, you know, you ask your friends and family for the investment, right? And uh, you know, instead of going out and raising a million dollars, right, you raise fifty thousand dollars and see how far that takes you. You know what I mean? You know, because what I've learned the difference, right, is that, you know, when I'm building Rice Rocket is, is I, you know, I'm not actively looking for investment dollars, but actually people are coming to me for it because I'm pioneering tech Hollywood. You know, that's the beauty of it, right? Because my business model can be applied to anywhere, any city, any place in the world, because 5G internet, as it's growing with the market segment, right, it's going to be developed over time where it's like affordable internet, you know, and and it's so extremely fast that you can distribute content on the cloud, right? Spotify is doing it, right? It's cloud-based, right? You have YouTube, right? It's all cloud-based stuff. And now you have gaming now, right? With Google Stadia. So, so what my thing is 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 what I'm doing is like you know when I when I was a venture capitalist with Luton Inc., right? You know when I was looking for investments, you know a lot of like 
Hollywood uh, uh, producers, right, were coming to me, and it's all the same thing, you know, like, you know, like, instead of asking for money, or you're sprinting, right, so to speak, right, for a project, once you run a marathon, and get investors to invest in your production company, which can form a studio, right? And over time, you build assets to developing movie projects or even television series projects or even animation, right? You know, what makes your secret sauce is that you also do your own video games by partnering with game developers and uh, you do the financing and publishing as well as like development for assets and you can partner with Netflix or Amazon Prime or HBO Max, right? The original stuff. Right. And you look at the where the market segment is going, right? You're very likely to get acquired, you know, over the like seven to eight years of your of your business. Okay. So so um yeah, that's that's a thing about Hollywood is like they didn't need to learn about how Silicon Valley does things like, you know, we I'm a holding company, but I have assets, you know, and it's, the Bay Area will have several new studios with LED production sound stages, right? How the Mandalorian was produced, okay. Um, you know, we're going into casino and esports gaming. You know, we look at the convergence of the gambling industry, right? You know, it's going to video games, you know, and let's speculate that either Biden or the next president is going to legalize online gaming in the US, you know, because they're already doing sports betting, right? It's up to the states to decide to legalize it, right? California's legal, right? So, so, you know, at the end of the day, it's like, what do we do here? Like, do we go after like Hollywood celebrities to get them in as, as actors in our in our in our film? The answer is no, because I'm not paying you know five, ten to twenty million dollars right for someone to act in a movie up in the Bay Area. It's just a ridiculous amount of money to spend on someone. You know, you you can take that money and, and do cancer research. You know, so so the, the the trick for me is like you know converging the music artists you know with video game industry. Right, because you look at these YouTube videos, right? You look at Taylor Swift and Katy Perry and Ed Sheeran and even Jay Z, right? It's like they know how to act. You know what I mean? Like the, the the trick is like, how do you get these guys to be in full feature films, right? So you 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 say, look, homies, like you have the music stuff, right? We have the game stuff. We have distribution, right? We have you know money right not only from silicon valley but access to wall street and eventually china once the trade war is over right because what's going on with the industry let's look at stick back with film right like china will become the biggest market in the world right film games whatever because you just buy population in the working class right it's like the, it's growing right while here you know we're, we're dependent on stimulus checks right now okay so so, you know, how do you get access to the Chinese market? Okay, well, for one thing, Hollywood and China, they've been doing business for over a decade now, right? It's not really going too well. You know, like, there's a saying that on signing our contract, there's a beginning negotiation with the Chinese, right? Well, that's a stereotype. That's not true. You know what I mean? Because, you know, why would Chinese spend a million dollars to pay someone to direct a movie? That fucking doesn't make any sense. You know, you should pay someone a quarter million dollars, right? Whatever. You know what I mean? You're not curing cancer here, whatever, right? So that's what Silicon uh, New Tech Hollywood is. Like, we're not over budgeting, you know, our payroll. You know, we're, we're, we're here to hang out and make cool stuff, right? And that correlates with the music industry. Because I think artists, they just want to make cool stuff, you know? And if they can converge, like, like for example, Taylor Swift, right? You know, her issue is, like, her, her ass has got sold, you know, to a third party, right? Like, whatever, $300 million, right? But she has legal right to re-record her music, right? So what's the difference between like the license stuff between like her stuff, right, and the, the other party stuff? To me, as a licensee, it doesn't make any difference. I'm going to a lowest bidder for my Taylor Swift uh, music soundtrack for my movie, whatever, right? But that's kind of fucked up on my part, right? Because I'm not really benefiting the artists, right? So for her, you know, like she could like work with Silicon Valley with New Tech Hollywood and, and, and take her song, one of her songs, and make a feature film. Or, or do an, an animation, right? And, or do video games, but based on the music from the past albums and her upcoming music, right? Because, you know, music artists, right? There's so many ways to make money from the ancillary market, right? Because commercials are making money off of them, right? Movies are making money off of them, right? You know, whatever it is, because the publishers for music and labels, they get benefit of the profits, right? So the, the, the music artists are very much control uh, less in terms of what they want to do in terms of making their music and 
doing cool things with it, right? So, you know, what New Tech Hollywood is, we provide the opportunity for them to, you know, actually do pretty good with Silicon Valley venture capital. Because when you look at what's going on, right? Like, I believe it was like a couple of years ago, one of the bigger Silicon Valley venture capital firms, NEA, right? Which is by Dick Kramlick, right? They had a partnership with CAA to invest in an animation studio, you know? So, so you know, we, I'm not the only guy doing it, right? You know, because like Silicon Valley, the Bay Area, we're known for the video game industry, you know? And since the given birth of Atari in the late 70s, right? You have EA here, you know, you have Japanese offices like Capcom and Sega here, right? You know, you have you know Zenga, right? You have Warner Interactive, you used to have Disney here, right? So, so, so what's the next stage, right? I mean, like you have Lucas, you know, Lucasfilm, you know, from, well, Disney owns them, right? And, and Industrial Light and Magic, you're over Bay Area, you have Pixar across the Bay in Emeryville. So, so, and, and on top of that, it's the opportunity to create jobs in California, right? Because, you know, the film industry, you know, it's no longer just based on LA because the internet fucked everything up, you know, thanks to Netflix, right? So, so, you know, like, you know, now the film industry is in Australia, right? You have a runaway program there now in Atlanta, in Georgia, right? You know, you have Vancouver, right? And you have the Europe, you have Nigeria and Africa, right? So the film industry is becoming a global scale. It's going to be bigger, right? And you just can't use a traditional Hollywood model with independent finance and distribution to emerge a new trend in the market, you know? So that's amazing. So, uh, Luden, so how do people that, um, that like you said, like um, you're looking for directors and singers and people that are um, like – that want to work with you, how would they keep and get in touch with you so that they can be part of your new tech Hollywood and also celebrate with you? That's a wonderful and amazing Asian heritage month. Um, how, how would someone keep in touch with you or get in touch with you? They, they, they could add me on LinkedIn. I mean, like I only add professionals, you know, I, you know, because I don't want to waste people's time and I don't want people wasting my time, you know? Um, so, you know, they just go to my LinkedIn profile and check out my bio and my background. And if you want to add me, add me. If you want to talk, uh, you know, introduction, you know, meeting over the phone. We say, hey, what's up? And uh, tell me about what you're working on. I'll tell you what I can do for you. And uh, because, you know, the thing about cool thing about uh, what I forgot to mention is, is that, you know, because of the job act of 2012, and this is not utilized by curators, right? I mean, it's out there, but it's not really educated in terms of marketing that's available, you know, for people to use, right? So the Jobs Act, you know, what that says is like non-accredited investors can invest, right, in, in, in uh, business ventures, right, that are normally uh, for like high uh, net individual investors, like private equity, okay? And there's a there's a limit amount that you can invest as a non-accredited investor. So you and I, you know, for middle class, right, we can actually invest in, in, in a startup, right? And you can apply that startup into a film venture, you know? And and just imagine this, right? Just say, like, you know, you, you, you spend a little bit of money, right? You go out and you raise money from your friends and family, say $50,000, okay? And this is for a horror project. So um, we're going to, this will be the end of part one with Ludin. So check us back for part two with Ludin. We're celebrating uh, Silicon Valley Ludin Studios raising 25 million film initiative to celebrate Asian Heritage Month for New Tech Hollywood. And so come on back for part two. This is part one with Ludin Lee. Thank you everyone for listening. Luden Lee, appreciate it. And coming back for part two with Luden, he's going to explain his new tech Hollywood and all the amazing things that he's doing, especially for independent artists or artists who want to um, just work, just all about the work and, um, and making video games and amazing content from animation, music videos, films, horror films, double movie night. There's so much that Luden's doing that we probably need like 10 parts. <laughs> Thanks everyone for listening. and. Um, come back for part two with Luden Lee.